Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Um, we have a green market today, which is a bit crazy right now. And it's a little confusing why. That's why I'm here, to break it down. Even though it's a bit wild right now for why this is happening. <laughs> also, the Ukrainian president is addressing a joint meeting of U.S. Congress right now. It's kind of important news. We should probably be pulling that up right now. Um, hello, hello, hello. Let me open up my chat. Open up the chat. It is a Wednesday morning, middle of the week. Middle, middle, middle of the week. Emmanuel, what's up, what's up? Amit is the greatest. Love you, Emmanuel. Appreciate that. Everything looks green, so you know it's going to turn red as soon as J-Pal speaks. Yes, today's the FOMC meeting. It is, um, it is going to be an interesting meeting. Let's just say that. It is going to be a very, very interesting meeting. Uh, we're about to go through expectations. We're just waiting until some people come in. Let me tweet out this link right now. So I can tell the world we are live. Live now, speaking on these green markets. All right, so good morning, good morning, good morning, John, RM, good morning. What's up, everybody? Um, interesting, interesting stuff that's going on right now in the market. So if you're wondering why the green stocks are green, mainly the China stocks, the reason for this is because Chinese regulators have spoken with Xi Jinping, who is the president. Uh, and as a result of this meeting that has occurred, there are more bullish concerns for stocks. So let me go to sort of uh, this thing right here. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index surges 9% best day since October 2008. Think about this, an index surged 9%. Not just like a stock, an entire index. That is a that's like the Nasdaq or the S and P being up nine percent in a day. Like that's that's rough. Um, so we're gonna read this real quick, and then we're gonna go to the Ukrainian president who's live on CNBC. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index closed nine percent, but remains down more than two percent. Um, the federal rate decision will be announced today, likely gonna see twenty five basis points increased. Alibaba, Tencent, and NetEase up twenty percent each of them. They're all up. And again, the reason this happened is because. Regulators that are, that spoke with Xi Jinping uh, basically made public comments that let investors know they should be bullish on stocks. I mean, that's sort of the, the basis uh, idea around it. Uh, the comments were surrounding the fact that they're not going to crack down on these companies, that they're going to let the free markets operate a little bit more. You know, like just sort of generic things you want to hear coming from a president. Uh, you know, to understand that things are things think things are going to be helpful in a in an economy, especially for uh, you know beating down stocks. So let's open up CNBC Live. I want to hear Zelensky speak. There he is. All right, let's open this up right now. We will be able to save thousands of lives in our country. In so he is addressing the entire U.S. Congress virtually right now. So we'll watch a little bit of this and then we'll move on. Okay, we can't hear him that well, to be honest, so I'm not sure if this is the best use of listening to him. Maybe there's a better. Better. Yeah, it's not. I think I'll rather give you guys the summary after it's over versus. Yeah, it's, um... it's just kind of hard to hear him. So I'm like, I don't know if it's worth. Okay. Oh, they're playing the video right now. Okay, let's watch this video, actually. So this is the video of what's going on in Ukraine right now. This is created by Ukraine to sort of show what's going on.
Close the sky over Ukraine. He is urging the West to get involved and participate against this war against Russia. In the end, to sum it up, today, today it's not enough. All right, so it doesn't depend anymore go. only on you and your people. It depends on those next to you, on those who are strong. Strong doesn't mean weak. Strong is brave and ready to fight for the life of his citizens and citizens of the world, for human rights, for freedom, for the right to live decently and to die when your time comes, and not when it's wanted by someone else, by your neighbor. Today, the Ukrainian people are defending not only Ukraine, we are fighting for the values of Europe and the world, sacrificing our lives in the name of the future. That's why today the American people are helping not just Ukraine, but Europe and the world to keep the planet alive, to keep justice in history. Now I'm almost 45 years old. Today my age... He's only 45, that's pretty young. This guy's only 45 and he's running this, wow. ...stopped when the hearts of more than 100 children stopped beating. I see no sense in life if it cannot stop the death. And this is my main mission as the leader of my people, great Ukrainians. And as the leader of my nation, I am addressing the President Biden. You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Ah, so he just called on Biden. He's basically saying, hey, Biden, you got to do something about this. By the way, guys, the technology that's conducting this, look at the bottom left. Zoom. Zoom is what they've trusted to be able to conduct this very important meeting. Interesting stuff. Thank you. Slava Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. So we've got all Democrats and Republicans agreeing to clap on this one. They're all standing up. They're all clapping, but and they're gonna send 13 billion bucks to Ukraine, but they're not getting involved in this war. So like, <laughs> they're not, not doing that. That's it. They're done. So this is, so this is a live look at the U.S. Capitol. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling on Congress to help his country survive Russia's onslaught. He appealed to the American memory of Pearl Harbor and 9-11 and patriotism and asked directly for a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Now, he also showed a video with the images of the horror of the war that, you, that Russia has brought to his Ukrainian people. This is live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Rhonda, let's start... All right, interesting stuff. What do we think, guys? What do we think? Is that going to influence how the United States approaches this? Uh, or is that going to just, you know, go over their heads at the end of the day? 300 million people would die on the low end of World War II. 70 yeah, that's the thing. I think as, as, as sad as it is and as, like, you know, whatever uh, emotional arguments you want to make, logically the United States knows there's no way they can get into a war, right? This guy was in showbiz. He knows propaganda. Now, I think what he's showing about Ukraine, like, is true. Like, it's real stuff. It's just the problem is you can't do a no-fly zone because that creates the war. Like, that's how it happens. 
Um, cowbell is ready. We have five minutes. We have five minutes, ladies and gentlemen, to open the market. Owen says, what does this have to do with 9-11 or Pearl Harbor? Well, Japan is when Japan attacked America in Pearl Harbor and uh, terrorists attacked America on 9-11. So the argument he's making is that those were two pseudo invasions of your country uh, in different forms and different mediums and different attacks. And the United States, you know, responded with fury with Japan. They launched a nuke and with uh, Afghanistan, they went into a 20 year war, which is probably not the best idea. So he's like, hey, if this is if you guys know how to respond militarily, when something else is really bad is happening, you should respond militarily. The problem is, this is not the United States's war. This is Ukraine's war. And the United States will go to war for their freedom. But is the United States going to be able to justify going to war, not for other people's freedom, but for a war in which they aren't theoretically involved in outside of, you know, Russia being the main adversary that they have. But if they get, you know, that that's war with Russia at the end of the day. And I think their argument is like, look, we'll help you, but we can't get into war with Russia. It's just so, I feel like if Russia didn't have nukes, the United States might've done something. But if Russia didn't have nukes, Russia probably wouldn't be as powerful in any way in the first place because the United States would have been tried to assert their dominance and power. The nukes really, they stop a lot of stuff. Morning all around the metaverse. Somehow I feel opening bell is one minute slower than actually opening. Guys, there's a weird delay on my live stream. And I have, I'm confused why. And I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to get it fixed. I'm trying to get it to be real time. Unfortunately, there is a small little delay. So yes, 9.31, you guys will see <laughs> the opening live stream, even though 9.30. Now, granted, this is the software I use to get it to be HD. So if I use a different type of software, it won't be as HD as it is, which is kind of sucks because like HD is amazing. You guys can see this crazy beard in HD. But nonetheless. Uh, Owen says, what Pearl Harbor 9-11 event has occurred? What the hell is he on? Well, yeah. I mean, he's comparing Russia's uh, invasion to Pearl Harbor 9-11. Probably not the best comparison, but that's what he's talking about. Yeah, peace talks already starting. That's a good point, Moon. So it's like the climax of the war likely... Ha I mean, but, you know, we will see if it overall has passed. Baba is up 92 at $92. If you bought Baba yesterday, you're up 20% on your money. Most people aren't up 20% over a couple of years, guys. So, like, everyone was, you know, including myself, you know, crapping on the Baba folks yesterday, saying, how could you buy this horrible company? And now Baba's up $92. Palantir's up three, about 2.3% in uh, pre-market. Um... The entire market's doing well. Whereas uh, Bitcoin got to forty one thousand last night, and today it uh, it's not there anymore. I think it went down, right? Where is Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin's at forty. Yeah, see, last night we got to forty one seven one five. You can see that right there, and then it came back down to around thirty nine, and now it's back at forty. We're gonna see how the market reacts when this opens. We've got a minute, we've got one minute. Netflix pre-market is up 5%. Tattooed Chef pre-market up 4%. Uh, Google pre-market up 24 bucks, almost 1%. Not, not too bad. Affirm is up 3%, everything's just up. Look at Tesla's back at 800. We, we all knew Tesla was coming back to 800. $4,000 pre-split. Uh, NVIDIA's up 3%. Opening bell! <laughs> the markets have opened. If that didn't wake you up, I hope you are up. Let's look at it. Boom, boom, boom. Lots of green. Lots of green. Lots of green. Lots of green. I wanted to be a musician, but... Or a singer didn't work out. Alibaba, that's the focus of today. These Chinese stocks, ninety-two bucks. Does this hold up? I mean, that's the question. Let's go to Neo real quick. Neo's up seventeen bucks. Neo was down at uh, fifteen, or it got to thirteen last night. Yeah, Neo is up doing really well. Baba, I'm interested because I want to see if this holds. Like, so we're seeing the orders in real time. You can see it right here. Question is if it's gonna hold. That's the question. Does Baba hold? Uh, put your predictions in the chat. Do you think Baba crosses back over a hundred 
within the next week? Or do you think this is a sell-off? Do you think people take their 20% gain in one day and sell off? Because most people that bought Baba, they bought it to average down. So I doubt they're going to sell off. But if you just bought Baba yesterday for the hell of it, like 20%, I mean, I would probably cash out. Like, probably a little cash out. Um, someone says Vivo. Let's go to Vivo. Vivo, Vivo. Vivo is a thing. I don't know if Vivo is a thing. Yeah, put that symbol in again. I don't know if uh, Vivo is a thing. Um, you said PayPal. Let's look at PayPal. PayPal. Oh, PayPal. Back over 100. Not bad, PayPal. Still still a while down, but not bad. Um, ARC. How's ARC doing? 56. All right. ARC has a long way to go, man. ARC has... It's just... I don't even like looking at ARC anymore. It's like... So many of their stocks have to do so good. Coinbase, obviously 160 because crypto's up. Uh, Shopify edging back towards 600. Now, the curious thing about Shopify, which I'm very intrigued in, by the way, is if you look at their chart, they got to 1,700. This is them in COVID. Uh, they were at 460, worst roundabout. Then they ran to 1,700, and now they're right back down to where they were. May 2020, around the 580 level. We will see what happens there. SoFi is down somehow still? Why is SoFi down? Bro, people need to give this stock a chance. Now, I say that as someone who has not bought it, but, like, I don't see major red flags with this company at all. So, like, I it it's only, this is one of those stocks that's literally only down because of the growth markets. That's it. It's kind of like Facebook. I mean, there's like no reason Facebook should be trading this low. Same, there's no reason why SoFi should be this bad. Um, that's what it is. Now, have you guys heard of this stock called Mullen? I've got some DMs about this. This apparently is a candidate for a short squeeze, okay? Mullen had around 500 million. Yes, 500 million in volume over the past couple of days. Um, yeah, let's, let, let me look. Let me look at the volume on Mullen right now. Volume on Mullen right now is 9 million and it's been three minutes of trading. Like, this stock has started to get hype. I think Twitter is a combination for it. Stock tips is a combination for it. If we look at the charts, on the one month, that's the sort of big run up. So, um, it was at 52 cents, got up to 190. This was in February 28th, went right back down. And then recently, it was at a dollar and it ran up to about $2.90. So, 100% gain. Now, let me, let's look up some facts about Mullen. I'm not suggesting to buy this stock because these stocks look like stocks that you can get screwed in. Um, if we go to Google Trends, by the way, let me just show this up. Uh, Mullen is trending from what I checked. So look, if we do Mullen stock, as you can see, there's 100 in the past week, right? So obviously people, they weren't interested. There was a little run up here, people were interested. And now people are really interested. So what is Mullen stock? What is this thing? Let's talk about it. Why it's the penny stock of the moment. Microcap EV player Mullen Automotive is a hot topic on Reddit. Here's why Mullen... Uh, of course it's Reddit. Of course it's Reddit. I forgot. I thought it was like Twitter and some Discord. It's Reddit that's pumping this bad boy. What else would it be? It has to be Reddit. All right. Mullen Automotive. Mullen is an electric vehicle company that also operates CarHub, an artificial intelligence-based platform that lets users buy and sell cars. Interesting. Now, I don't know too much about Mullen, so I'm learning about it right here with everyone else. Currently, with a market cap of $60 million, the microcap has caught the attention of Redditors. Redditors have got the attention. This has led to a sharp increase in daily trading volume and helped to boost the stock's performance more than 40% in the past trading days. So this Reddit sort of volume that was Im imposed on the stock uh, and along with some stuff that they've undercovered, which I guess we'll find out in this article, has led to this this 40% rise. Uh, here's a close look to the meme stock. Okay. Why is there so much buzz about Mellon? Unlike some other meme stocks, Mellon's recent surge isn't due to a short squeeze. Although there have been reports that short selling has increased considerably in the past few days, Mellon's gains are the result of it retail investors buying a large volume of the stock. So as we can see with a retail stock, when there's a lot of hype, GameStop and AMC, that's uh, sort of the prime examples. Uh, when retail investors buy up a lot of it, you develop this sort of cult-like following. Even if the cult only lasts for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, a couple of months, AMC has been going strong for a year, uh, then there is a considerable 
ability for the stock to potentially, you know, rise. In the last 10 days, Mullen's popularity on social media has led to a spike in trading volume. Currently, Mullen has a mo modest float of 1.8 million shares, but a 10-day average trading volume north of 240 million. So we need to analyze that real quick before we get into the article. A float, well, what, is a, what is the float of a stock? The float of a stock is how many outstanding shares there are, right? So if you buy up a lot of shares within the float, the stock price has to go up. It's basic levels of supply and demand. If you have 10 shares and someone's buying up nine of them, the last one is going to cost a lot more money. Whereas if someone bought one of them, the last nine are going to cost less money. Uh, when you have more trading volume, that's buying pressure. It pushes up the price of the stock. In comparison, a growth stock like Palantir has around 2.1 billion shares outstanding. So if if someone trades, you know, a, uh, you know, 10 million shares of, of 2.1 billion outstanding shares, there's not a lot of buying pressure likely or volume for the stock to be able to considerably move up. Uh, but if you have 1.8 million shares, that's it. That think of that 2.1 billion to 1.8 million. And the average trading volume is 240 million shares traded per day. All there has to be is more shares that are buying than selling for the price to significantly go higher. So what people on Reddit do is they try to find these really small stocks that have very small floats. Because if you can convince enough people to buy up enough of the float and really get it trending the way that this Mullen thing is getting trending right now on social media, then you have the ability to, to legitimately like use the power of the people to push up the price of the stock. Now, the question is, if, if, if is this a good way to push up the price of a stock? If this is an ethical way, uh, is this a meaningful way? And is this something that's sustainable? The, 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 the easy answers are, it, I don't think it's unethical because Wall Street and hedge funds do all this type of nonsense all the time with insider information. They pump stocks, dump stocks, all this stuff. So it's not a question of ethics. It's a question of sustainability and who's left holding the bag. Because if you bought GameStop at 320 because you thought it was going to 600, you were left holding the bag, right? Same thing with AMC if you bought it at 40, 50, 60 bucks. Um, so the question becomes, if you're buying Mullen at like 1.9 or 1.7 or whatever it is, if you expect it to go to three, if it never gets to three and it dumps at 1.7, which is very possible with stocks like these, uh, is it worth buying at the end of the day? Mullen has given intense exposure on sites like Reddit and Fintwit. Fintwit is Twitter and stocks on Twitter. On March 14th, Mullen was named one of the top five dis uh, discussed tickers on Reddit, even more popular than Apple. Uh, beat Apple. Look at this. Mullen Automotive over Apple. Goodness gracious. Okay. The recent buzz around Mullen is due mainly to the company's announcement regarding the development of next-generation solid-state polymer batteries. Mullen says this technology is a major advance over the current lineup of lithium-ion batteries. Okay, so this is a tech technology development, it seems like, that's getting people to actually, that's actually getting people to care. Um, interesting. Also, keep in mind that the company went public relatively currently. Ah, it went public in 2021. Since then, its stock has lost more than 90% of its value due to concerns over inflation. So let's go to Mullen real quick on Weeble. Uh, let's go to the range year to, uh, like just max. So Mullen went public at $600. That doesn't make any sense. Did they do a reverse split? Yeah, I think they would have had to. Obviously it doesn't make sense for them. To oh no, this is 2012. Ah, oh, weird. Uh, maybe it went public again. That's interesting. Mullen company went public relatively recent. Interesting. Am I am I looking at the right ticker? M L M U L N. Oh, I might be looking at the wrong one. M U. No, I'm looking at the right one. Interesting. Okay, so we got to resolve that. We got to figure that out. Maybe they went public again. They like did a reboot. Uh, let's keep going. Is there still some time to join the fund? So here's the question: Can you still get in on Mullen? Now, again, my, if you're watching this, I'm not doing this. This is very risky. I've been in stocks before where I bought it at 130, thinking it would go to three dollars, and I got crushed on them. It's very risky, so I wouldn't advise against this, but let's see what they say. It's extremely difficult to anticipate how long a stock like this will remain a momentum play. The current stock market environment has been terrible for tech and growth stocks. Mullen's polymer battery development should be an important step towards long-term growth. In addition, the company has an interesting retail strategy manufacturing plans. And Mullen recently announced a series of partnerships for the engineering and production of the EVs. Now, as cool as that is, the question becomes, is that going to be executed against? Because they can put out all the fancy plans they want and get people excited but getting people excited and then buying the stock is not really a, strat a strategy. This startup is in its early stages. The stock is more down than 90% from its debut price. Little Wall Street coverage. Um, it's possible announcements can send Mullen shares back up to their IPO price. And as you can see, you got a big disclaimer. <laughs> because it's like, this is one of those highly, highly speculative stocks. So let's, uh, let's do a little bit more digging on this. Um, let's go to their website. Do they have a website? They have to have a website, right? Mullen. It's so sad that I search them up and I only get these articles. Like, I don't even get their website. Mullen Automotive. They've got to have a website. Okay, Mullen USA. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So here's the here's the, here's the the news story around this. 
pure electric crossover. So, so they're selling electric cars. That's what they're doing. They have a unique battery technology. Okay, I thought it was only the battery technology. They're actually selling cars. So this is an electric car company. That's what it is. That's what's being pumped, an electric car company. And let's go to their about real quick. Oh, here's the founder. Okay, I'm not going to lie. This guy looks a little... First of all, let's go to his Twitter. What is this man's tweeting about? Is he tweeting right now about everything that's going on? Yeah, he's not tweeting. <laughs> he's like, I'm not trying to get sued. I'm not trying to go to jail. He's just retweeting. He's not tweeting a single thing, bro. All right, so that makes sense. Uh, David Mitchery, chief executive officer. He's been leading since 2014 with 25 years in executive management. Okay, interesting. Uh, okay, this is the battery R&D manager. This is the guy who's doing the, the physics, I guess, around the battery. Okay, so that's that's management. Interesting. Let's go to about. What do they say they're about? We need change yesterday. Okay, first of all, why is this bleeding onto the picture? That's just, that doesn't look good. That's bad. The world needs help in lowering the damage and impact of fossil fuels, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so they care about fossil fuels. This very, like, Tesla-oriented mission. Muscle is a Southern California-based company that owns and partners with several synergistic businesses, all working towards the same goal. Okay, so they want the world to be clean. They, uh, 2014, okay, founded in 2009, the award-winning company All Electric Sedan, uh, across the, the other company being Tesla, so they're comparing themselves to Tesla. Coda was focused on accelerating the adoption of electric vehicles by improving performance, safety, reduce. So they have Coda, that's one of their electric cars. Mullen GT, found, founded in 2002, um, the fastest production car in 2006. Moment Technologies is, is the product of strategic union of the economic efficiency offered by the Coda Automotive. All right, so they have the point is in 2014 they kind of went into the into the they incorporated as a company and they've done all of this since then. They've launched some cars, they've launched some shows, they've launched some shops, and today they are working to create electric vehicles at scale. That's what they're. Someone said that he looks like a criminal in the chat. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't want to say it. But I feel you, bro. I feel you. Okay, so this is that's the that's the core of the company. Then the battery, Mullen EV battery technology, the next generation of battery technology, lithium sulfur. So when they say next generation of battery technology, the only reason I get skeptical is because I'm like, Tesla is doing this. I think at levels greater than any company in the world. So when you say, like, when the stock is pumping off this battery news, let's look at the stock again. It's at one point six five right now. Um. It's a little, it's a little weird. It's pumping off of battery news. Five times more energy density, fifty percent less cost per watt hour, uh, exceptional safety, sustainably sourced and manufactured, uh, solid state batteries. I mean, like, what's so different between this and Neo? What's so different between this and Tesla? Like, I guess that's my larger question. Because if I don't like, if I don't know that, then I don't know what's the soaring value proposition of this, like of the stock at the end of the day, right? Like what exactly is the is, is the unique reason? Dragonfly, this is, again, coming soon is cool, but like getting a car to market is the hard part. So it's like you can't be betting on the potential of this stuff when the stock is this dad and like uh, things are things are also that pumped up in, in the markets. EV fleet, they have a commercial van coming out. All right. I mean, overall thoughts look very risky to buy stocks like these. I know people have been asking me to cover it. So there it is. Uh, it's a company that has some innovative battery technology. They don't have cars on the road yet. You can reserve it from the website. Wall Street people or sorry, Reddit people are seeing that the stock only has 1.8 million in float. There is some of the unique technology that will allow it to explode. People were saying on Twitter last night that it's, its market cap could reach about uh, 1 billion. The market cap right now for Mullen Automotive. Let's go to it right now real quick is um 59 million so if it gets to a billion you're you're talking about a, a little bit more than a 10x bagger right so like you it would be a substantial return the question is how does it get to a billion and if there's enough juice in it for even for, for it to even get to you know two three hundred million uh from here which would be two three x of of its return so these are stocks to be a little bit scared of if you're if you're going in just for that ultimate pump if you're riding in for that all right but if not if you're if you actually believe in the battery technology and the value proposition of mullen uh i would advise to do a lot of research because it's like uh, test it's, it's hard when a company says that when you've got things like tesla around um so yeah mullen automotive those are those are my thoughts all right chat what's up 
I've been ignoring you for a bit. Let's let's get back into this. Uh, this is just another EV pump. I'm just focusing on Tesla. He looks like a Grand Theft Auto character. <laughs> Bruh, I'm not gonna lie, bro. They like the pictures you pick are important. Owen says Float has outstanding shares that can be traded. Amid. Yes, that is correct, Owen. Thank you so much for 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 uh, letting me know that. Now we've got to cover a couple of things. Uh, the FOMC meeting is coming up. And we've got to talk about what to expect from the FOC meeting. And then on top of that, we have to go check on Baba. Because, you know, uh, Arab people call their fathers Baba. So I wonder how they are feeling knowing that Baba is uh, up 20% right now. Well, Baba's down to 88, so we dropped under 90. We see a lot of red orders coming in. Uh, <laughs> again, is this like in this market, how many runs are sustainable? Re look, remember Twilio guys, do you guys, do you guys remember Twilio's earnings? Twilio had a phenomenal, phenomenal earnings. I mean, look at this. They were down at 190. They had a blow out the water earnings, ran up to 233, amazing gain. And then it came crashing down to 135. Twilio is actually, I'm looking at Twilio. I like that stock. I don't like the stock. I, I, I like the company. I'm thinking of the stock. That's what I'm trying to say. Palantir, up 5%. Not bad. Not bad. But a lot of these runs we've just seen of like this could, this day could just be another dead cat bounce as it's always been. This is just, this is just how the days are going. Yo, stop shilling these meme stocks. Trust me, I am not still shilling the meme stock. I am advising everyone to not get into that meme stock. Uh, I just wanted to cover it because it is trending but i am not uh i am not i'm not shilling you, your first mistake is looking at the facts and being rational pump and dumps don't care about those yeah but some some facts uh, are relevant to the pump and dump like like for example if you didn't think they had some unique level of battery technology the pump wouldn't be as intriguing as it is uh so like there has to be some level of context that goes into the pump and dump like for for gamestop I mean, when it was pumping really hard, yes, it was irrational, but there was some logic that GameStop was transitioning from being this, like, game company to, like, a more tech company, and that also led to the pump. Now, was it obviously irrational? Yes. But, like, to get people to believe in the hype, you've got to have some level of logic. It's, I think it's, like, a communication sort of psychology argument for, for these pump and dumps. Uh, Tesla is many, many, many years ahead of the competition. Yes, Owen, you are correct about that. You should probably buy their stock and hold it then, Owen. Just saying. All right. Here's everything that the Federal Reserve is expected to do at its meeting this week. The meeting is today, by the way. Meeting is today. Okay. The Federal Reserve this week faces the monumental challenge of starting to undo its massive economic help at a time when conditions are far from ideal. In the midst of geopolitical crisis in Ukraine, an economy that is off to a slow start, and a stock market that is in a state of tumult. Hold on. What? I've heard turmoil. I've never seen this word before. Tumult? You better look this up. Tumult definition. A loud confused, confusion or disorder. Yeah, but why did they say turmoil? Why did they say tumult? What's the difference between tumult? All right, so tumult means disorder. Turmoil. Yeah, it's the same thing. Like confusion, uncertainty. That's interesting. Why, why? I've never seen that word. Tumult. Okay. The Fed is widely expected to start raising interest rates following the conclusion of its Wednesday meeting or two-day meeting. Those three elements pose a daunting challenge, but it's soaring inflation that the Fed will focus on the most when this meeting starts Tuesday. The economic outlook supports the Fed's current plans to boost the federal funds rates in March. So we're going to get a 25 uh, basis point hike. We're probably not going to get 50 because the market has been decimated and 50 is, you kind of probably don't need 50. I mean, you probably need 8% to be honest to combat inflation, but at least from a market's perspective, 25 should do enough to get people to stop spending a little bit more, right? Markets have no doubt the Fed will enact an increase of a quarter percentage rates, uh, where the committee goes from there, however, is hard to tell. The 25 is a given. What matters most is what comes after. I want to know how this affects inflation. Like, that's my question. How is this going to affect inflation? We think the message around the rate hike has to be at least somewhat hawkish. The real question is whether the Fed is carefully hawkish or aggressively hawkish and whether the meeting springs any surprises or not. Um, our call is that the Fed will be carefully hawkish and that we will avoid springing in any surprises that might add to certainty or volatility so like here's the question right we know that there's going to be a 25 basis points hike 
And as a result of this 25 basis points hike, the market is factored in, which is why I think the market's not red today, right? The market is fundamentally green today because we're like, all right, we know the Fed is going to do this because we know the Fed is going to do this. We have baked it into our investment thesis, which is the crazy thing about the market. As long as you bake it into your investment thesis, then everything is fine. It's like, oh, there's a war happening. Well, we bake that in. There's no issue. But it's like, oh, we didn't know this was happening down 20%. Like markets just collapse. Like it's, it's actually kind of insane how, and I think the reason for this is because humans run the markets and humans are inherently like, you know, they have this weird psychology that goes on. But so we know that's going to happen. So it's not, so, so it's not going to crash the markets. The, the, you know, Jay Powell's not going to do 50 basis points because he knows that the markets are already baking in the 25. They didn't bake in the other 25. So he, if he puts that other cake in the oven, it's not going to bake correctly. So he's probably not going to do that other 25. The question becomes what this means for inflation. So let's go to this part. The dot plot is part of the summary of economic recessions, a table updated quarterly that also includes rough estimates for employment, gross uh, domestic product, and inflation. We'll go to that into a second. In December, the committee's median expectation for inflation as gauged by its core preferential personal consumption expenditures price index points to inflation in 2022 running at 2.7%, which is up from 7% right now, or 7.9. That figure obviously vastly underestimated the trajectory of inflation, which is up by 5.2% a year ago. Wall Street econ economists expect the new inflation outlook to pump uh, to bump up the full year estimate to be about 4%, uh, though gains in subsequent years are expected to move little from December's projections. Still, the sharp upward uh, re revision to the 2022 figure should keep Fed officials focused on the need to respond to too high inflation with tighter policy settings. Basically saying like, okay, because of this sharp revision of what's going on in 2022, um, there still has to be tighter policy settings while not also crashing the market, even though we have to recognize that the market does have to crash in order for us to get back on charts. Like I was seeing some tweets yesterday saying like, look, if the S&P just fell to 3,800, we could get this whole recession nonsense over with. The fact that we're stuck in limbo in this 420 range, knowing that we probably need to drop to 380 to like get things moving again, because sometimes... It's like you got to just reset sometimes, right? Sometimes you just got to get things back in order, even though that's going to cause a lot of pain. That would be a legitimate recession, which obviously no one wants. Uh, the Fed still has to be hawkish without being overly hawkish because they obviously don't want to cause a recession. And like what's happened with the war in Ukraine and oil prices has basically done a lot of the Fed's job for them. Like markets have sold off. The goal of the Fed is to decrease market stimulation and markets have sold off. I mean, stocks are down 80%. So it's like there, you would think there is no reason to crash the markets even more by making it more tighter but with inflation rising exponentially i mean like that's the question of just like what is this going to mean for inflation uh let's look at the balance sheet outside the questions over rates inflation growth the fed is also expected to discuss when it starts preparing the bond holdings on its nearly nine trillion dollar balance sheet to be sure the central bank is not expected to take any firm action on the issue this week now the uh, the, the fed has still been printing money since since march they they're gonna stop i believe this month to the tune of like 25, 30 billion dollars a month, some crazy number like that through quantitative easing, uh, which is the bond buying program will win down this month with a final round. Okay. So 16.5 billion in mortgage backed security purchases. When the fed buys this stuff, it helps the economy as the res as this ends, the FOMC will start to chart the way it will allow the holdings to start reducing a program, uh, sometimes conversely called quantitative teething and they will uh, tightening and they will teething. Isn't that like what a bit of baby does with their teeth and they will see if they should start selling. They will also see if they should start selling someone says admit you mispronounce so many words <laughs> you know i really do and i'm supposed to be a good speaker but i like i mispronounce so many different words balance sheet reduction will likely be discussed but increased uncertainty makes us think that formal normalization principles will be announced in may or june okay so the normalization principles in may or june to actually do the quantitative tightening and selling of those bond purchases they've been doing for the past two and a half years since 2020 when interest rates were literally negative that's going to start to happen most Wall Street estimates figure the Fed will allow about $100 billion in bond proceeds to roll off each month, which means selling, rather than being reinvested in new bonds, which is currently what's happening. That's the difference between quantitative tightening and easing. The process that is expected to start in the summer, uh, and Jerome Powell will be asked about it soon. The question remains, where are you going to be in the middle of 2023? How is inflation, how is growth going to look? This is the reason that I think the Fed should be more dovish and should communicate that. Now, noted, when, when Powell speaks on inflation, last time he spoke, he said, uh, inflation was worse than expected in December. And he said this, I think in the January meeting or the like the February early meeting, and then boom, markets tanked. Like they were having a literally green day and then markets tanked really badly. So what, what we're expecting the Federal Reserve to do is do something that the entire market has understood, baked in, which means there's not gonna be a major effect on the market when they, when they announce the official 25 basis points increase. The question is gonna be how does Powell 
talk about what's going on. Because if he talks in some type of way that gets the market scared or gets them a little bit concerned or gets them to think that there is a chance for seven rate hikes or gets them, you know, to feel a little bit confused about what's going on with GDP growth, like whatever he says, that's why he's, you see when he talks, he literally is talking like he, like he, there's a gun to his head every time they ask him a question. They're like, hey, what's your name? He's like, my name? is Jerome Powell. Like, he's so scared when he's... They'd be like, what's two plus two? And he will literally think about it. Because, he, because like, he'll be like, I can either say four I can, or I can say 22. And the way the market reacts to how I say four or 22 is gonna, you know, I'm, I might get killed if I don't say the right number. He's like, well, the perception of 22 might think I'm more creative, but four means I'm more logical. So do I want to be more dovish or hawkish? Do I want to be creative or logical? Like that's the stuff probably going on in this guy's mind because his words move the market. You talk about a market maker, it's not Citadel. I mean, it is Citadel, but it's Jay, it's Jay Powell. I'm going for a little metaphor here. He is making the market. So the question in this meeting is what is he going to say? And it's so interesting to see, again, as I talked about the human psychology of someone saying something, and then just that affects the entirety and the entire nature of the market. So we will ultimately see what happens. But in terms of inflation, I don't think a 25 basis points increase is enough to affect inflation, to be honest. Like, inflation is still pretty bad. I think the supply chain issue has to get resolved. People have to stop spending. And hopefully that creates a deflationary effect um, over the next six, seven months. But if we're able to get that 7.9% to maybe peak at 8.3, 8.5, and then start to work its way down, that would be awesome over the next couple of years. The question is how long is it going to take for that to happen? And are we going to have to go Paul Volcker style 1980s, where we just like completely let the free markets take over in order to have so much advanced growth without, uh, inflate, inflating the markets artificially with pumping liquidity. So we will see what happens, but I will keep you updated on it. All right, back to the chat, 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 chat. Someone says Tesla is recession proof. Someone says 3,800, are you crazy, Bo? I'm not that crazy. I saw a good chart. I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, but there was a very good chart saying that 3,800 would be actual correction territory, like, or like kind of bear market territory, but like it reversed to the mean average uh, when you look at these charts. And like, that's actually a good thing for like, or it's a healthy thing in the context of markets. I mean, the whole market's gonna tank, but it's a healthy thing for markets to just like drop and then eventually work their way back up. Otherwise, if markets never dropped over time, the market would have started at zero and been at like, you know, 10,000 by now in terms of the S&P if it just never had these drops. The reason it has these drops is because it gives you a chance to build back up. And it's like, it's kind of healthy as the economy gets inflation too high, all that stuff. So 3,800 was like reverting to the mean of the S&P, which is where I got the number from. Uh, but I mean, obviously it would cause a lot of, pain. I mean, if, if S&P goes to 3,800 pounds, it would probably be a $5 stock, maybe less than that. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be pretty at all. Uh, PPI, you're asking about PPI. I actually haven't looked at PPI to be honest. Let's look at PPI. Okay. Let's go to this wholesale inflation climbed 0.8% in February, lower than estimate. Let's actually see if there's a CNBC video on PPI. I'd rather watch that and get some analysis. Get some analysis. There we go. Here we go. All right, let's watch this, guys. PPI, this is the... Um, this is the... Um, producer price index, which is a family of indexes that gauges the average fluctuation in selling prices received by domestic producers over time. So it's about how people are charging for their products, less about how people are paying, which is more of inflation. Rick Santelli is standing by at the CME in Chicago. Rick, take it away. What are the numbers? Yes. Well, let's look at Empire, which popped on the wires first. Uh, this is a March read. Uh, we we're expecting a number up 6.4, a big miss, minus 11.8, minus 11.8. That is the worst read going all the way back to May of 2020. Uh, so that is a huge miss. Now let's get to our wholesale invent, uh, uh, inflation numbers in the form of the producer price index for the month of February. The headline month over month up eight tenths of 1%. That is, of course, not as high as the nine tenths expected. One percent in the rearview mirror, and the high water mark was in January of 2021. That was up 1.2. If you strip out the all important food and energy, the core is up two tenths of one percent. That is one third of what we expected. One third of what we expected. The high water mark there is one percent. Several times, the last being July of last year. If you remove food, energy, and trade. Well, that is up 
two tenths as well. And that is definitely a well moderated number. Uh, one third also because we're expecting up six tenths for both the X's, X Food and Energy, X Food Energy and Trade. Now let's get to the money ball numbers year over year. Year over year headline is up 10% exactly as expected. That is the new high water mark going back to record keeping in 2010. The old was up 9.8 several times. If we look at X food in. Okay, so the core thesis he's saying is that the February producer price uh, index, it rose 0.8%, slightly lower than expected, uh, which I believe is a good thing if prices are going up less than they should be going up. Um, you know, it's it, 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 it the the hard part about this is like how do we fully know? Oh, camera's out. Hold on, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Don't worry, I have this camera. Boom. Yeah. So I was saying the question is ultimately how do we think inflation is going to react to the like like if inflation is up seven point nine percent, right? Um, as it was in the last thing. Like the question is how much is the PPI? index going up or down can affect based on inflation now if it's if the prices are not going up as much as we think they should be going up that's theoretically a good thing uh inflation then would have to you know sort of uh, interact in the same way proportionally in terms of prices people would have to stop paying it p things are getting less expensive would mean inflation goes down as well so if uh, people are not charging as much for their stuff that's a good thing now in the real world when i go to the grocery store things are getting really expensive i mean it's absolutely insane like it's, it's quite literally insane um, Owen says it may prove an inflection point. Yes. I mean, that's the point. Like if, if, if the price pro producers index is going down and people are charging less for their stuff, it's lower than expected. Even if inflation was going up, it may show an, an actual inflection point where 7.9% is tops for inflation and, and, uh, uh products and producers are going to start to lower their prices because they don't need to charge as much because there's not the sort of pressure of supplies and demands that cause the market dynamics for them to raise the prices. Because again, no one wants to raise prices because they want to raise prices. They want to raise prices to maintain their profit margins. And that's only because the value of the currency that is being traded to buy their products and services are decreasing, which means they have to increase whether it's wages or the actual prices of their products. Rules called me a professional streamer. Yes, I am. I'm getting a, I'm getting a hang of it. Getting a hang of it. It's been two weeks of doing this. I am absolutely getting a hang of this. All right. Uh, do you have access to not live news emit? So I had the uh, I had the YouTube TV subscription for like sixty five a month for live news, but I canceled it because I'm like, first of all, that's a lot of money just to stream the news live. I'm not streaming all day yet. I, that will happen in the next couple of months, and that's when I will have live news so that I can actually like literally stream what's happening live in the moment. Um, which is similar to having like a cable channel TV just uh, like subscription. It's important, but at this moment, I'm not streaming live all day, so I'm like, I don't see the the new the need for it right now at the moment. Um, but yeah, really interesting stuff, guys, in the market. Let's do one final check at Baba. Let's do one final check at Baba. Baba's back at 90, so it's holding up. Baba is indeed holding up. Baba's doing what it has to do. It's holding up, and it's getting there. All right, guys, that is it. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. 45 minutes wrapped up. It just flew by, 49 minutes actually. Uh, I, I have some really important meetings today. And the meetings that happen today will influence the trajectory of my life. Uh, I'm not uh, being hyperbolic when I say that, so I, I will let you guys know. Exciting announcement coming on Friday for the Palantir community, most likely. Very excited to get this out to you guys. You guys will enjoy it for sure. And uh, yeah, I will see you guys later throughout the week. Please like the video if you haven't given it a like. Appreciate it. It means a lot. Patreon in the description, five bucks a month. Help support out the channel. And I will see you guys soon tomorrow. Or I'll actually be here late night, stock talks, 10 o'clock. Probably maybe 11 o'clock at night. We'll talk. We'll chat about what con went on in the market. We'll talk about what happened in market close. And uh, we'll probably talk some philosophy and stuff like that. Thank you guys so much. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.